バナーキーですね Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this live stream by the Urban Cycling Institute um, and today we'll be talking about this new idea of uh, cycling as a service. So it's all about bike sharing and uh, innovation and how we can uh, move cities forward within the, this new landscape of technology. So there's a lot to be talked about today in relation to current news but also on the research side. And uh, my guest here with me today is Brett Petzer who is a, a researcher at the Eindhoven University of Technology doing his PhD on exactly this subject. So Brett, say hi to everyone. Hi, hello everyone. I'm really happy to be chatting to you today and uh, look forward to your questions. Awesome. Uh, to start with Brett, I, I kind of wanted to, uh, you know, we've known each other for a while. We did our PhD together in Eindhoven uh, and you, you, you are from South Africa yourself, but then you developed this fascination with, with cycling in the Netherlands. So, so tell us how it all started, Brett. Right, yes, uh, give me a sign if I'm not brief enough. But, uh, of course, go for it. <laughs> it, it, wasn't, it wasn't such a quick process. Uh, I was already interested in space. I was studying architecture, uh, had a brief but disastrous uh, career as a drafts, draftsman um, in, in an architectural firm. And uh, then I went back, I became more interested in the urban planning side of things, and I was studying that in Cape Town. And uh, one day I had a little uh, small car accident uh, on the highway, Not, no injuries, but my car was uh, written off. And um, I was also left on the highway for ages, it seemed, uh, on an elevated highway. So there was no danger at all, but it was, uh, it was strange because I was in the middle of the city that I live in, but couldn't get out or get off. And um, I, it, it gave me some, it was the beginning of a feeling, it, I'd been studying the city, I'd been studying Cape Town, the certain, a very particular history, a really extreme form of like capitalism and segregation, all, in, all abetted by cars, impossible without cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I didn't have a car myself and I got into cycling, which I'd done earlier in my life. And started to unlock the city in this very different way, especially the the city that had always seemed very friendly. I, I'd, I'd been aware intellectually of how difficult a city it is if you're not wealthy, but when on a bicycle, my body was in danger all the time from people who who just weren't even looking at the road while driving, you know, um, and the cheapness of my life uh, to other people in cars just because I was on a bicycle, the, the way that the bicycle discounted me and made me, yeah. turned me into an expendable person and took away all my middle class armor was fascinating. And then in that year, it was 2015, was the year that somehow or another the first uh, Amsterdam Summer School for Cycling came along. And I had gotten a grant of, um, for my masters and it came so late in the year that everybody who didn't get the who didn't who really needed the grant had already dropped out. It was quite a disaster. But for me, it came along after I'd paid my tuition. So I said, "All right, I'm going to Amsterdam," and got there and met uh, Mark, Professor Marco to Bromelstrut and um, Meredith Glazer and and um, these incredible oh, people. And everybody got radicalized there. I mean, we were um, I. I came home and immediately initiated a program of car freelance car vandalism and uh, you know and uh, <laughs> um, but uh, it Amsterdam of course is radicalizing anyway because it it is simply what is possible it's it Im imagine if this mode was allowed to work yeah imagine, and I, imagine I remember no one stopped it. I remember excitement, right? So we started, you started uh, your PhD in the Netherlands, I think uh, a few months after myself. 
Uh, but you came to Amsterdam to do Play in the Cycling City in tw 2015 before that. And, and now it's like four years later, we're approaching the end. But remember yes. that excitement uh, back when we started, right? Uh, it, in fact, I, we all met you uh, through a, a Skype online interview, uh, you know, back uh, when you were phoning in from, from South Africa. And, yes. uh, and, and there was that buzz and excitement to, to be able to discover this world uh, where, where things are in a way turned on its head, right? In the Netherlands. And, um, so so the, like you came from South Africa, uh, started your PhD, and I, I guess the, the, the part where the, the excitement, you know, wore off, and then after that, you know, a few years into it, uh, what struck you as, as something that, you know, people don't notice on first glance about the Netherlands? Well, now there's, uh, there's, there's a number of things. I think that's been, that's been the hard thing to learn. Um, yeah. It's 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 definitely what I think most people don't see at first is that the system is a national system and not everybody will have the opportunity to not only enjoy cycling in Dutch city but have a reason to continue beyond the edge of the city, not just to beautiful windmills or, or something, but right right on into farms and wilderness and find well wilderness uh, find that the system goes with them and it's always there ahead of them it always anticipates their journeys and wherever you are you are your you, your needs are anticipated which is an experience that most people will only ever experience uh in cars yeah you know highways service stations tires engines engine repair, all of these things are, they go ahead of them. And that's something truly amazing here. Cool. Um, uh, our topic well, of the day, yeah. yeah. And our topic of the day, day is uh, cycling as a service. Um, so that there's actually, uh, from your research and from the general discussion in the media, you know, we found this actually quite surprising fact that um, cycling as a service in a place where uh, cycling is so prevalent is is actually quite different from cycling as a service as as you would implement it in a place where there's barely no cycling at all. So it's a it's a difference between an emerging market and then a, a very mature market. So we've seen uh, you know four years ago that was when you know, MoBike and all these uh, bike share systems were popping up all over China. Mm -hmm. This was like just when people were realizing how ridiculous um, unchecked bike sharing can become. Uh, the mm -hmm. trash heaps and and all that. So, could you uh, just give us a, a brief overview of, of the the global landscape uh, in which bike sharing is taking place and how that has really evolved in the the past four years? Mm, yes. Um, well, I was lucky to start this research in the year of the Big Bang, um, <laughs> when uh, what had started earlier in Asian cities uh, and had bloomed there was a real a real free market for for bike share um, cities which had a high tolerance I think even if they're very neat cities like Singapore uh, there was a high tolerance uh, for the flooding of the streets um, to a certain extent with this new technology which requires a bike really every 200 meters if it's going to work and in, Chi in Beijing um, and in Shanghai and in other cities in China, uh, there were also multiple um, fleets, uh, that none of which were really interoperable. And so each of them had to have a bike every 200 meters. In, in Singapore, there was really more one dominant player, I think at least initially, so it was a little bit more manageable. But it was something which fitted into those cities in a way. It was tolerated because it was legitimated by reasonable numbers of, a reasonable amount of use. Mm -hmm. uh, the same uh, technology then entered Europe, um, some cities en masse. And in Amsterdam in 2017, in, in one summer, there was this uh, arrival of many, many, many bike share companies. Well, um, only two or three big ones. Uh, but they, as you say, in most other places, bike share has been uh, introduced, subsidized, welcomed, because it's, it's intended to pioneer a cycling culture. So people are willing to 
um, people are willing to do a lot uh, in terms of the municipality or government or relaxing rules or just generally making a bit of a niche for us. They're willing to do a lot to see it become viable or succeed. Mm -hmm. But of course, in Amsterdam, uh, this technology was entering an incredibly mature cycling ecosystem where there are many uh yeah and it's like a, a cave ecosystem that's been evolving for millions of years and has its own uh balance and introducing um bike sharing to that was like bringing something from the wild west into um the civilized east i guess yeah. So it was controversial and I was very happy to be studying that controversy as it began and then to see how it evolved in the next two years where there were also a number of quite, I think, quite unexpected things that happened. Um, I could t talk us through that if you like, but that's just basically the beginning. Um, cool. Let's, uh, let's yeah. uh, just bring the audience in on uh, the main topic of discussion, which is the, the paper that you wrote. So what, uh, it's behind the paywall, but uh, we were able to you know, think of a, a solution around that. So Brett has shared with us the uh, pre-publication version, which you can freely distribute. Um, and I've included a link to that in the, in the, uh, in the live chat. It's a, a second chat from the top. So if you want to follow along as we get into the paper, you're free to do so. I'll uh, also put it up onto the screen. Uh, if you're listening to this audio only, I'll read out the passages as we go along. So uh, before we dive into this paper, Brett, let's, uh, let's go to the background, uh, mm. the background of what inspired you to write this paper and, mm. uh, and what uh, you know, led up to it, given this uh, climate that you've entered into. Yes. Um, well, luckily, there's uh, some structure impo imposed on me by my PhD, which has to deal with certain topics. And uh, the main one is the is cycling based mobility services and their role, the potential that they have within an integrated Dutch mobility system. So I was free to go out and develop four papers that with, within that theme. And of course, right, right there, as I was as I was shopping around for my first paper, things really started kicking off in Amsterdam. Um, so that's that's the build up to this paper is the interesting question of why a highly developed mature cycling country um, does not also have on top of everything else a, uh, a nationwide uh, cycling as a service uh, economy, a whole set of service providers um, that's as developed as the rest of the cycling set of ex the bundle of cycling experiences that you can have is. So it's there is, of course, the uh, we'll get into all of these providers, but of course, there's the one big one, a beautifully highly developed national, uh, the overfit system that operates from train stations, but it has its limitations. And if any trip that you would want to do that doesn't start or end at a train start and end at a train station, uh, the overfit is not really for you. Um, and certainly if you're not Dutch and you don't have a Dutch mobile number or bank account, it, it's also not really for you. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more that could cycling as a service could give, could, could bring. And the interesting question for paper one was just, um, why, why doesn't it already exist? Right. Basically, if everything uh, else does in, in the cycling world. You know. So I'll, uh, I'll read back to you what, um, what you wrote to, to begin this paper. And, and the, the, this kind of really frames the, the academic discussion uh, around uh, the, the cycling as a service as a concept. So I, I quote this from the introduction, uh, cycling as a service, uh, referring to services such as bike share that provide users with temporary access to bicycle has been promoted around the world as a low carbon form of global emissions. Um, right, uh, sorry, uh, global urban form of urban mobility that is uh, cost, energy, and space efficient. Considering that transport's share of global carbon emissions is at 23% and rising, cycling as a service's potential to combat climate change on an urbanizing planet is significant. 
However, despite the Netherlands' strengths as a leading cycling nation with a long history of cycling innovation, Dutch cities have lagged behind their developed world counterparts, especially in Western Europe." End quote. Um, would that lagging behind idea still uh, apply uh, today? Because there has been a few experiments being done. Things have evolved since uh, you wrote, you actually started this uh, paper in 2018. There's a mm. few more experiments that went on. Um, do, you, do you get the feeling that the Netherlands is, quote, catching up? Or is it adopting its, uh, completely its own uh, way of doing bike share? Uh, yes, I think it's not catching up because I think there's no one to catch up to. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think the one of the great problems of, of cycling policy in the Netherlands is there's not many people to learn from. Um, of course, there's the whole world of, of experimentation to look at, but um, there's only really... I. This is very much my opinion. I'm sh there's many diplomatic reasons to agree, but I think there's maybe some the Danes, but otherwise there's nothing. Uh, that that's what I that's my view. Um, so uh, there is more experimentation than when I started looking at this. You're absolutely right, but um, in many Dutch cities, um, you can't get you still just can't get to the end of a tram line or a bus stop and get out and just continue your journey by bicycle to a rural area or an outlying uh, part of a city or go from one peripheral part of a city to another uh, or do anything uh, on a bicycle unless you start at the NS station in the center where the overfit system is. And I always use the example of Eindhoven, which is where George and my George, you're based there part time. I'm based there most of the time, although I live in Amsterdam. And in Eindhoven, you're a city of um, oh, I don't want to get it wrong, but I think 150,000 people um, with many outlying villages, uh, lots of business campuses on the edge of town. And there are 24 uh, bike share bikes available in Eindhoven from one supplier outside of the Overfits. And it just it just doesn't have bike share in the way that London or New York does, or even smaller cities in France, uh, where you can really use perhaps a dock-based system where you walk out of your door on the edge of the city and you're able to go to another location and leave your bike. And there are all these good reasons why the Netherlands doesn't have that um, yet, but I. I'm not sure that there are reasons why it shouldn't have it in the future. Uh, I think that they could also, on top of everything else that the bike system provides, they could also just be um, an, an bike share as a, without a second thought in across Dutch urban fabric. Mm -hmm. um, let's uh, yeah. let's get into the, the framework of it because that's that's what I think you did quite well here. Uh, is this uh, fit and conform versus stretch and transform? So you took all mm -hmm. the bike sharing systems uh, mm -hmm. and inventory of them, and you you've kind of evaluated these based on this framework. We'll get into the data uh, right after this. Mm -hmm. but could you explain mm -hmm. the context in which you performed this research? Yes. Um, so. In a way, part of the problem I had was to take cycling, which I wanted to talk about, and try to re-engage with cycling issues through the lens of transition studies. Um, and transitions is something I've, I was introduced to during the PhD. And this fit and conform or, or stretch and transform uh, model um, is something that I encountered through transition studies and really it's about um, empowering uh, it's about empowering innovations and understanding uh, what what can be done or what should be done not perhaps not everything that can be done should be done um, to give promising innovations a chance or uh, to it understand perhaps why they do not succeed or do not su have not succeeded yet and uh, fit and conform or stretch and transform these are really two kind of, these are two strategies that if you wanted to break into a, a system especially a, a really mature uh, 
ecosystem for cycling and you had something that was a bit untried, you could try to fit in with the system as it is, conform with it and hope uh, that eventually you'd get your big break. Or you could stretch and transform the system by uh, boldly setting out uh, to be to do something different and knowing that you're going to get a little bit, little bit more of a headwind on you but um, ultimately if you survive you can transform the system transform the expectations transform institutions but until those things do transform you're going to have a, a, a rough time of it and so that was the framework really it's about strategies uh, used by um, I guess, in niche actors. Great. Let's, uh, uh, on that point, let's get to the next part, which is you, you made this illustration graph. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble zooming in, but I uh, hope you can uh, see this. Um, so it's, it's this graph that shows on the y-axis the fleet size, on the, on the x-axis um, the, uh, the, in blue, the Obey Feeds fleet, and then uh, in orange, all other fleets. Uh, fleets. Mm -hmm. So you have the data up to 2017, and you can see that um, before 2017, that the market in the Netherlands was completely dominated by uh, OV feeds, so the public transport uh, bicycle that's owned by the train company. So mm -hmm. they are really the default uh, mm -hmm. market provider in our context. Uh, and, and only recently, uh, in 2017, has other uh, providers really even entered the market. Mm. Um, so, so is that something that's that's very different from other contexts having this incumbent, um, mm. and uh, what effect has that had on the competition um, going forward? So, what, does this mean that other competitors have to stretch their offerings, or mm. how does that fit into your model? Well, you know, that's a that's a really great uh, question. Um, the there's a few things that make it um, that were quite difficult about this paper. And the one is that Overfits is a massively successful system. It is extremely limited in what it does um, in terms of freedom and offerings. But most people want what it does do. That's the bulk of the demand. Um, and What's, so that's the first thing is um, it's a, it is a massive incumbent and it's also uh, I think uh, only recently become profitable after years and years and years of investment investment which I think no one but the NS could have done um, so it's not as if uh, the NS uh, the, the overfits is sort of um, a huge cash cow and now that it exists, nobody else will ever get a chance. It, it, it lost money. It only broke even extremely recently. And no one but a massive uh, railway, uh, something that big, could have, kept, could have kept with it all this time. And the second thing is that as Marco's, uh, Marco de Bromstrut's papers with um, Lucas Harms, I think, um, and, and many others, and I think with Roland Kacher, there's been uh, wonderful papers that have shown that Perhaps the truly unique thing about the Netherlands is the is the bicycle and the train together, because they add up to a national life. Uh, if you have one, if you have a bicycle, you can. You, a Dutch city is yours. Everything in it, even a Dutch region. But combined with a train, the whole country is yours, and you experience no constraint, as as I think you and I know when. We're in one Dutch city and something pops up uh, a meeting, perhaps in another Dutch city, in two hours. Can you get here with no car? Of course I can. I already know I can with the railways and the overfits together and the seamless way they work together. So that's a big thing. Uh, so for me to come in and say, yes, but what else can there be, is, was quite a bold thing to do. And it's, one is quite exposed because there's this massive, beautiful, complex thing in the, in, right in the middle, and literally in the middle of every Dutch city where the station is. And I was trying to look around it and see, well, why isn't it already doing all these other things that, that other, or why can't other firms do them? So, so sorry if this is rambling a bit, but it was quite a lot to unpack, and really the overfits is at the center of everything. And it itself is, is a, it's a behemoth, you know. Yeah. 
Um, so, sorry, all those things uh, came together and um, I almost think I've forgotten the question you started me off on. <laughs> Not a problem. I want so, to just go ahead to this uh, chart here that we have. Uh, I managed to I, zoom I, I, in a bit more. Uh, it's yeah. this one where it actually fits each type of uh, bike service provider into its own quadrant. Um, and uh, I'm sure, uh, when is this? 2017, 2015 to 2017. So the landscape probably has drastically changed, but let's take this as an example anyhow, uh, to see where everything belongs. Uh, you have the fit and fit uh, as the the ove feats right in yes. there um and uh and then the other big player which is actually almost completely dominated by this new idea which is swap feats mm -hmm. and it's in the stretch and fit model um yes. can you contrast the ways that uh swap feats which is the the tires or the blue band uh, differentiates from uh the ove mm. feats which is the the famous blue and yellow bicycles yes. on the streets in amsterdam Yes, and in fact, if I could ask you, George, could you briefly go to page six of the PDF? Um, no, there's, a, no problem. there's a table yeah. there that I think will, will help everybody uh, make sense a little bit more of it. Um, uh, if, I've got, if I've got it right, got page it. six. There we go. That's it. So um, uh, I should have set this out a little bit better before, but when I was talking about the fit and conform, uh, those are not new ideas, uh, but... Back in 2002, there was a, um, a scholar by the name of Hochma who was writing about electric cars. Um, and he, what he did, which I tried to use again, um, it is an idea that came from my co-author, uh, Dr. Hier, Professor Geert Verborn. Um, he went back and said, uh, sometimes these entrepreneurs or these niche agents have maybe two strategies that they combine. We, we, we might not want to say that they might have a startup that's trying to get electric cars off the ground and their strategy is either fit and conform or stretch and transform. Maybe the most useful way, but also we can't say that they have thousands of strategies. Uh, let's differentiate between two aspects, two dimensions, the use environment um, and the technology choice, the, the way the technology is actually developed and designed. Um, and sometimes, it, so then that produces this little table that you see between, uh, you might have a technology that fits in well with what is there, but your business model uh, departs quite radically. Mm -hmm. And so it was by uh, looking at these uh, four, four groups that you get fit, fit, uh, fit, stretch, stretch fit and stretch stretch um, and basically uh, when you go back to that table where we that we were looking at uh, what what becomes interesting is that as you said um, I think the chart we were looking at before was on which page was it yeah, there we go it on, um, go um, on 16 page 16 yep. um, yes that that in this landscape, when you look at the business models of everything that could be called cycling as a service, which I, I kept quite broad and simple, uh, really everything that gives you access to a bicycle, and I decided to include swap fits in that because it was having such an impact. It was a, a novel type of monthly leasing, and um, it's a good example of, of how this fit stretch model perhaps has something to offer because swap fits is a quite radical business model uh, combined with a an extremely traditional idea of what what bike share well not even bike share but what cycling as a service could be give people access to the experience of cycling without the need for repairs without the need for worry when a bike is stolen just get a new one you know um and so in a way they'd combined uh you could say that swap fit is radical but it's more interesting using this uh differentiation to say well their business model is quite radical a, a true subscription model for cycling that really is something new and that was massively popular rapidly increasing but the way they've um 
But sorry, uh, it, is it new? I'd, I'd oh, like to challenge you on that. Oh, um, sure, yeah. Is, um, is it really new? Um, mm. Because the, the uh, from, you know, uh, Mobike and the short-term leases, where we can see how that's new, that's not mm -hmm. possible without an a internet connection, the smartphone to, mm -hmm. and the smart lock. Yes. Um, but uh, the, the swap feeds, um, is it not just a, a, a type of bike rental service? Um, is, is it because it's long term, you still have a, a strong ownership component to it? It's like as if you would lease a car. Um, and yes. especially in the Dutch context where uh, accessing service facilities is relatively easy, um, it, it, perhaps there the advantage is actually reduced. I mean, you can get your bike repaired at any train station. You can buy a used bike at most, like any street corner mm -hmm. in, in the Netherlands, right? There, there's bike shops everywhere. Uh, so, so secondhand bikes to own or to repair are, are relatively cheap, relatively easy. Whereas in let's, a, a place where, where there's not so many uh, cyclists, th these uh, secondhand bikes repair facilities are actually much, much harder to access. Mm -hmm. So it, I find Absolutely. it interesting that you know, this model took off in the Netherlands where the comparative advantage is, is actually much lower than in other contexts where it, you would have to drive to a bicycle shop, you know, so if sure, you, you can't sure. even buy a bike in the first place. Um, so I guess the question is, does this model, in your opinion, apply in other contexts as well? Is it so unique um, in the Netherlands? Yes. Uh, well, I think the first, it's a, it's a great and good, it's a fascinating question. Is it new? Uh, what's what SwapFits offer? <laughs> and if it's not new, then why did they grow so spectacularly quickly? Um, and what had people been waiting for to offer yeah. something like this? Um, and I think you're absolutely right that uh, people people living in Dutch cities are very spoiled when it comes to the expectation that all you need to do to fix your bike is go to a train station, for example, where there are always there is always a bike shop that's just waiting there, open for you, ready to do anything you could reasonably need um, at reasonably low cost. Um, I think the, 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 the difference might seem subtle, but if you're on a fixed income, as, as are the students who were the first uh, great demographic, mm -hmm. it's quite significant, is that when you have paid for swap fits, you know that you couldn't possibly spend more on cycling in a whole year than the fixed monthly amount. Uh, you immediately, all of the, all of the, uh, uncertainty of repairs or uh, losing your bike and having to buy a new one at an awkward time that's all just gone and you've paid the price of maybe not even a night's drinking but maybe an hour's drinking for a month of cycling um, and that's uh, that has an appeal clearly um, so it's the bundling of services when you've got your swap fits you've been taken out of the bike repairing, bike buying, uh, inner tube pumping economy, and you've, you've, that's all handled behind the scenes, and your interface now is simple. It's just sending a text message to SwapFits, and somebody shows up, you know? Um, so true, it's, it's more simplicity than anything else, but it's definitely also uh, the reliability of leasing a bike, which you, you're right, has always existed, but it's, it's been for people who have, I guess, jobs and then lease yeah. a very expensive bicycle. You know, it's, it's never been available to just, just students, uh, you know. That is an interesting people. point because they started with like the, the most basic bikes, right? The uh, swap mm -hmm. feeds, uh, mm -hmm. OVA feeds. Actually, both of them, they, they just offer bare bones uh, options. Um, and and uh, like 10, 20 years ago when, uh, when the, the Dutch train system, I don't know if you know this, but they experimented with like, scooters and e-bikes and all sorts of weird stuff and none of that like really uh, survived yes. till the present day so there's something about simplicity and it's interesting to see as swap feeds is growing now they're they're offering uh options of uh you know e-bikes which are like almost a hundred euros a month right so yes. now only now are they starting to cater to this upscale which might be a completely different way of thinking so it's no longer loss aversion they're really going for for luxury but that's that's came much after mm, absolutely. Um, 
Yeah, and, and, and it's it's a fascinating thing because even if it cost initially 12 euros when it was introduced a month, that seems that is really cheap, but buying a terrible bicycle <laughs> might only be 50 euros. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, a stolen one in the buoyant <laughs> and invincible secondhand recycled bicycle economy of the Netherlands. You can you can also buy. And you can buy a stolen bike anywhere and get your bike stolen anywhere. Uh, so it, sometimes it, 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 it is a bit unexpected that there would, have, there would have been such a massive success when you could also just go without beer for a month. or a, <laughs> No, they can't. A, a weekend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they can't. They can't. Exactly, they can't. Um, is, is there anything else that uh, you would like to cover on this paper? Um, I, 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 I would like to maybe yeah. look at uh, that... Um, that image that I sent you, which unfortunately oh, yes. couldn't make it into the paper, it was a bit, uh, it didn't ultimately fit in with the theory we were trying to look at. Um, but what it is, is uh, it, it gave me a, an orientation to the rest of, in fact, maybe I should put that image in the Dropbox as well for everybody. Ah, if yes. I, well, maybe uh, well, so they can see it uh, in a little bit more detail. Let me just. I can zoom graphics. in and stuff, but uh, after the stock show, we'll link it to the description below. Yes, perfect. Yeah, perfect. We'll, we'll deal with um, that and then just check back. And uh, so, what it is is, um, it's a graph that shows uh, all the bike share firms, all the uh, cycling as a service uh, providers in the country that I found, and um, what it does is uh, looks at the size of their fleets. So each uh, little block in this image is uh, equates to about 25 bicycles. And um, then in color, you have the cities that they're in. Um, and uh, so it's maybe a little bit overloaded in the end, but that's I, I try to get it all in there. And uh, what what that produces in the end is this uh, you can see quite clearly suddenly uh, that um, there are only a few big uh, bike share providers. They are new, they are rogue, they are the Wild West ones. They are the dockless uh, bike share providers that are also very largely foreign. There was Flickbike, with, which is an honorable exception, a, a, Dutch, a Dutch startup. Um, and then, of course, there's enormous swap fits. Uh, which, you know, I, it's cycling as a service, but it, it's obviously on the edge. It really is leasing, not bike share in any traditional sense. Hey, look but, at the growth of uh, NS uh, over yes. time even. You have different growth patterns over time as well. That's cool. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, um, and, and so, yes, we have a market dominated by a few players. Um, but what I saw also quite quickly and that's why I drew these three, uh, these two dotted lines to divide this uh, field uh, into um, into three sections. Was that there was a big difference? Sorry, big difference in how legal these services were. You had a, you had the uh, a sort of wild, tr true wild west part of the graph on the left, uh, where permission to operate is informal or it's totally absent. And then you had on the far right, you had the, an area where the permission that cities have given to these uh, cycling as a service firms to operate is, is, is all totally by the book. They've got contracts, they've got permission, they're welcomed, only they are welcomed. Uh, it's all very structured. And in the middle is a gray area. And what was quite easy to see was that there were a whole number of um, cycling as a service providers. I call it CAS to make it even more Dutch. Um, but they, there are so <laughs> Maybe you should explain that oh, joke. Ca CAS would be <laughs> cheese in Dutch. So that couldn't be Dutch. The Dutch, they bleed cheese, you know. But um, uh, the, the, point, the point is simply, there is, uh, at the very bottom of the graph, there was this huge number of these, of minnows, these, these tiny, tiny little operators that are definitely doing it all by the book, but are also offering so little mobility choice uh, in terms of locations in the city or spread across the city that they're in, that they don't really make a difference. And a lot of people in Eindhoven, for example, where there is one bike share provider that's had a lot of you know, startup funding from the city and they're, they're doing their best and 
uh, you know, all power to them. But a lot of people aren't aware of them because they just they they uh, aren't allowed to get big enough to matter to the average person that's just trying to get around the city. Um, and so that's it. A whole lot of people doing doing it all by the book, but too small to matter. In the middle, a grey area, and then especially in Amsterdam, we got to the big the big ban where Amsterdam said, right, uh, too many bike share firms have arrived. This is causing chaos. Everybody off, everybody out, until we've worked out a plan. Um, and that meant that some of the firms just stopped operating, and all their bikes went to the warehouse. Others were able to on the go, re-engineer their entire business model and patch together some kind of way to continue operating. Like one of them was just a free floating bike share system. And after the ban, they were able to cobble together like a string of private premises where they could sort of operate and keep on going, but not in the way they wanted to. Anyway, uh, the point is, nobody could work out how to govern this thing. And that's why it had to stop. And that's why I think it still hasn't really come back. Uh, yeah. Rotterdam has been a bit different. Um, they have definitely allowed more experimentation and said, well, OK, uh, keep operating. And if there's big trouble, we can talk about it. Um, but other cities have said, you can't come back all of you cycling as a service people until you developed an interoperable platform uh, where one user can sign up to the platform and then use all the services and that's a quite a big ask um, sorry now I'm, I'm getting ahead of it but that's just I think in if my PhD can be summed up in one image it's uh, this one and um, uh, it shows that it's this one yeah, this, yeah, this, this, this one, one that's not in the paper. <laughs> um, it it just shows that uh, because if I, if I can also sum it up, basically the whole thing in one sentence is um, where there is no cycling regime, it's very easy to make to legalize uh, bike share and give it whatever it needs so that it can be regulated or go unregulated. It, it doesn't matter too much because um, it's only asking for a little bit of space here and there in a car dominated city uh, in the rest of the world. But in the Netherlands, bike share and cars is asking for space and, and parking space and other needs that it has from a highly developed successful cycling system um, which is premised on private ownership and has really come about through decades of activism and you know planning as we know from your other work your other chats uh, so uh, that's that's it it it's cycling is uh, it's not the wild west in the netherlands so uh, people jealously guard these things that have been so difficult to acquire and uh, that might be why the ns which already has all the space that it needs in a way compared to others doesn't have to ask for space to be able to run a bike share service, um, it might be why it's the only player in town. And I think that's a pretty good way to sum up the research there. Yeah. Uh, do, do you want to go to questions? So there's a, I'd love there's some, to. I think that's all that questions. I should lay out. Uh, oh, right. To to <laughs> let's go to questions here. Um, uh, do, you have the, do you have the questions in front of you? You get to pick. I do. I can see them. And just for our audio only guests, uh, if you could read out the questions um, sure, sure. before you. Uh, let's see what we've got. Okay. Well, uh, well, I feel Marco's already asked one, which is, of course, <laughs> is, <laughs> I feel like um, maybe I'll save that one for my, for my PhD defense. Um, but <laughs> no, I will not save it for that because then I will not get it. Um, I, I want to say I almost want to leave Marcos to as the, as the lovely treat that we can get to later, but pick an e um, not an easier one. And, uh, no, no offense to the people asking, but um, shall we do a practical one uh, yes, by yes, a Jerome? One. Yeah, let's do that one. Uh, I'll just give it a read. What do you think is the best way for a local government to regulate shared bikes, or do you even think it shouldn't be regulated? Right. So this is going back to your uh, your your chart here. 
mm, which yes, uh, yes. which oh. is uh, on which side uh, should should these mm. uh, services be in because you did a good job of saying where they are yes. uh, so I guess that comes to your conclusion like well, where should this be well thank you so much Jeroen for asking that question um, it's often I think with a PhD uh, somebody asks you the incredibly obvious question um, like uh, your PhD is the name of a, a thing that maybe has a question mark afterwards and somebody just asks you okay so then uh, what should we do? You've, you've gone and studied this, what comes out? And, and then, if, when I, before I started the PhD, it would have been really easy to answer, but now it's really, really hard. Um, basically, uh, Jeroen, what do I think should happen? Gosh, um, I think that we still have what Anna Nikolaeva uh, wrote about in, um, maybe Marco was in that paper as well, but it was about um, a constructed scarcity uh, versus a constructed abundance of space, even in Dutch cities, uh, where according to the mode of the mode, the mobility mode or the use, uh, there are types of space. There's not really one flat market for space. Uh, if you're in a car, although this is maybe the most advanced place in the world for thinking harder about uh, about how urban space is allocated there is a huge historical privilege that cars still have um, of, of, of space allocation and it's only changing relatively slowly still um, so when so sorry I'm definitely getting to your question you but the, the key thing to understand is that um, I think that if there is enough space and if Bike shares, um, if we take one subset of, of cars, let's talk about bike share. Um, the problem is space. Uh, I don't so much see it as the problem is privacy or data. I just see it as space. Dutch cities, like all cities, have an ever-increasing number of uses getting added to the sidewalk, uh, the micro-mobility, the bikes, the bikes that are poorly uh, parked and I want to always push back and say if we didn't have a space problem then you could regulate these uh, companies I guess it would suddenly become very easy just regulate them like anything else you know, like a uh, whatever it is from a, a, a freak tent or a, like a food truck that stands in the public um, and serves it's a commercial business it's in, on public land but it serves uh, the public um, I think the, all the controversy, all the difficulty is that these, uh, these are commercial companies using public space to store their vehicles between rides. And that's in the APV, the sort of general uh, model legislation that in each Dutch city is slightly different but has a lot in common. That just can't happen. So technically it's illegal. And that's why when these companies came in, the cities had in a way couldn't uh, give them anything except tacit permission to operate because all of them are kind of technically illegal and in some cities they've changed the APV in response and in other cities they said uh, not so fast uh, we have it's taken decades uh, and centuries to develop how we use space in the city so you can't just claim space inside our public realm we have to think really carefully and you have to demonstrate exactly how we all benefit from this and that's good but I still think with that cars have a relative abundance of space so it's the pavements where we keep adding new uses all the time and the streets and parking spaces that cars have and that the car system has is there's a relative abundance there of, of space and a relative scarcity in the in the pedestrian world, the cycling pedestrian world, and that's what my third paper is about, uh, which I've just finished. So, very much you're in the key question, um, and for me, it comes down to space and the like economy of space.
Cool. Yeah. Uh, I think that's an excellent answer, Brett. Uh, do you want to tackle the, the big one or oh do you want to save God. it later? Well, I'm sure PhD we can find <laughs> another one first. <laughs> let's have a little, let's I have a rummage in the we'll, other we'll, we'll do one more and then, uh, and then we'll wrap it up here. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. No, then I'll, then I will, uh, let's get to Marco. Um, yes. Go for it. Guys, <laughs> Marco, I want to say, if I could take a moment is my kind of spiritual leader, kind of charismatic, uh, provocateur figure that um, if we ever were to go on a worldwide uh, car vandalism campaign, he would definitely be questioned. I mean, definitely. Um, so, uh, but I mean, so uh, asking, asking the, the, the smart questions is absolutely Marco's forte. So thank you. What is the conceptual difference between shared bikes and rental bikes and rental bikes understood of as a mass, mass scale rental bikes? Um, uh, that would be, that is the key. Um, but I honestly have not reached any conclusion on that. Um, in the end, in this paper, I just decided to adopt some kind of definition that includes everything, everybody who's offering bicycles, um, on, uh, the basis of use. And I decided, because I struggled to define, to find the definition that Marco, Marco is asking about, and I didn't, I couldn't come up with anything solid and satisfying. I called it all cycling as a service, and instead try to emphasize how all of these services that step outside of the tradition of uh, access on the basis of ownership, they all therefore have some problems in common, because institutions uh, from insurance to uh, what legitimates your right to park in the street had all grown up around the assumption that people own their bicycles. Um, and to an extent, all of these companies have stepped outside of that, so they, yeah, they're all, it affects them all. And for me, I, I just, I couldn't answer Marco's question in 2017 so I thought better to analyze them as one group and emphasize what they have in common. So that's a non-answer. Um, sorry. <laughs> well, with a non-answer, I, I think we should, uh, we should close with a, a question, you know, uh, and, and that's a good point. Sometimes, a lot of the time, we, the, the question is much more important than the answer. So uh, we have uh, your own coming back with, with another question, which I encourage you to, to think about, you know, uh, as, you, as you watch this. Mm -hmm. And the question is, quote, but can't shared spa bikes save space compared to, quote, normal bikes, since you can share the bike with more people? Hmm. Mm -hmm think through that, you know, uh, for, for, for people who are watching, right? So, uh, and, yes. and these are the types of complex questions that, that we try to tackle. Uh, mm -hmm. These are the questions that uh, Brett uh, writes about. Uh, and these are the questions that, that have more complexity than at face value. So with that, Brett, uh, I want to uh, give you the floor uh, and let people, how can they get in touch with you? Where can they find you on the internets mm -hmm. and on social media um, and, and all that jazz? So let them know. Well, everyone, uh, again, just thank you for this. Uh, I really hope we'll do more of these. Or, uh, you know, this is such a great opportunity to meet people who have, who are interested enough to engage, um, and that's great privilege. So, thank you, George. Um, I'm available at brettpetzer.com, and my surname is spelled like Peter but with a Z, and Brett with two T's. Um, and uh, I try to put everything on there. I'm not great about it. I'm a little bit more active on Twitter at Brett Petzer, um, and that's where I try to uh, deliver hot texts. And um, I, I don't know, um, but <laughs> I've I've been really quiet in my whole PhD because I've it's been um, quite a thing for me to learn how to write um, really and truly academically and engage with theory, whereas my instincts are all more just journalism really uh so and now that i've reached a point where i've finished my third paper i'm starting to put out more thoughts because i feel that i am allowed to <laughs> you know i've <laughs> i've made my big mistakes already theoretically and i've, I've le hopefully learned from them so i hope to put out engage a bit more and put out uh, including george and i are writing with the other phds just a brief response to the, these crazy times we find ourselves in of 
sustainable immobility or socially unsustainable immobility in this corona time so we'll be putting just out just thoughts about that and thank you very much brett again for joining us and that that brings us to the end of the show so if you enjoy this content and you want more please go ahead and smash that subscribe button uh hit the like button button if you really loved it and thanks again for joining us uh and we will be back very shortly this corona times means lots and lots of live stream times so take care and thank you everyone <laughs>